Packard, let me know if it's correct. Arthur Williams, DOC number 332577, third class offender, for eligibility date 8 1 2021. Uh, good time date 12 18 2033, full term date 7 4 2041, a 44 year sentence. Uh, Attempted escape, forcible rape, theft over 500. Does that sound correct? Yes, sir, it is. All right. How old are you, Mr. Arthur? 48. And for the record, we have Mr. Randy Meyer that will speak at the uh, appropriate time. Mr. Randy Meyer. Excuse me. And we have uh, Mr. Charles, Ray Charles Arthur. Yes. Okay. Then we'll, we'll speak at the appropriate time. How old are you? 48. How long have you been incarcerated? Uh, approximately 23 years and a few months now. 23 years on the 44 year sentence. Uh, tell me when you last display a rider for us. Um, March 1st of uh, 21. Tell me about it. I had, I was intoxicated. I had um, smoked something that I wasn't supposed to do. Mojo or was it bump? Yes, I, yes it was. And you've been in jail 23 years and you didn't know that probably wasn't a good thing? I know I tried, I know. I, I know. Yeah. That's, that's tough. That's going to be a problem for me. Listen, have you taken sex offender treatment? Yes, sir, I have. You taken all phases? I've I've been in, in one phase at a few different facilities, and um, it's not that I hadn't taken all the phases. It's just that I've been getting kind of stopped because of uh, either been moved from a facility or and recently this COVID. So right. I hadn't had um, able to actually finish the whole Treatment. So, right, you haven't taken it. You've taken just phase one, is basically what you're saying, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Look, I mean, there's a lot I could get probably we could rehash, but look, the, the, the disciplinary is going to be a problem for me. And I, I'm going to be consistent. If you haven't taken all the sex offender treatment, that's a problem for me as well. Um, staff, you have any input there for us? Yes, sir. Um, um, my name is Colonel Anthony Alamo. Um, right now, this uh, individual, uh, Mr. Williams, actually works for me on the wall. Um, he arrived here in 2016. He's a very, very hard worker, very respectful to staff. Um, and the incident that he had over a year ago with the intoxication, it, it, nothing matches in his record or even his street charges to even come close to what he had did. And he apologized for that for two or three months. So I know it, it hurt him and he didn't uh, really like what he actually did. He was mad at himself with it and stuff. It wasn't like he's just a constant user like some of them that I do have. But, you know, prior to that, he was three years right up free and um, he messed up, made a bad decision. But He's a very, very good uh, worker and respectful to staff. All right, thank you so much for your comments. Yes, sir. Um, Teresa, do we have Ray Charles Offer on there? Yes, sir. Okay, we're here from uh, Mr. Uh, Ray Charles Offer now. Hello, how, how are you guys doing today? How are you doing? Um, bless, bless. Um, Arthur James is, is my uh, first cousin. You know, he he was my first uh, brother. You know, I, I was the I'm the oldest uh, child that my parents have, and he was like my big brother. You know, he 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 taught me so much, and you know, going through life when you don't have that that piece, that that piece of the puzzle as far as just you know um, family. You know, it's hard, and I and I and I and I miss my my better half but i know you know he had to pay for for his mistakes and i, I feel like you know through this time it, it's it's finally getting to him and he's understanding what it is you know um at the beginning he didn't have 
he didn't have a good support staff. He he didn't have people around him that was telling him, you know what I'm saying, uh, or trying to help him to get better. You know what I'm saying. And right now, our family is in a, in a, such a a much better spot. You know, um, I, I know if if you guys would see it in your heart to allow my cousin to come home, that the support staff that and the love that would be around him and show to him. He would be an exemplary citizen. I, I just feel that, you know what I'm saying? I believe that. And I just want to thank you guys for the, uh, allowing me the time to speak on my cousin's behalf. All right, thank you. Now we're here for Mr. Randy Meyer. Yes, sir. We also have a victim who would like to speak. Um, it's the JPDA uh, that with no video. I'd like to let her speak first. Okay, I follow. I didn't know that. We were just we were just informed that she does not want to speak. Okay. No. Then then I shall. <laughs> uh, Randy Myers is a DA in Jefferson Parish, and, and we have a strong opposition to Mr. Williams's request. Um, it was a horrible, violent crime. He beat and raped the victim, and then brought her to a, a second man to rape. Um, but let's go and look at what he's been doing since incarcerated. His limited programs, he did living in balance in 08, but then got the disciplinary report in 21 for intoxication. He's got a total of 46 disciplinary reports and almost one every year of incarceration. He's had a lot of uh, discipline uh, reports over the years. Um, he's only had a couple of other uh, programs to, to assist in his rehabilitation. And he hasn't completed the sex offender treatment program, which is, I think, hugely important. That's, um, he's only done one of the uh, four phases of sex offender treatment. He had a poor supervision record. Uh, he was on supervision three times, revoked each time, and was on uh, under supervision when he committed this offense. And there's strong victim opposition. Um, she is present today, but apparently doesn't has decided not to speak at this time, but she is strongly opposed. Uh, so for all those reasons, we are also strongly opposed to his request. All right, Mr. Meyer, we just got an, uh, another note on my desk that the victim does want to speak. So we'll let the victim speak. How about all that? Right, thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, this, I'm opposing his early release. He has caused me to have feelings of this most of every day of my life since then. I carry around a fear of trusting people, always looking over my shoulder, fear of driving in certain areas, now nightmares of the image in my head that won't go away. I thought I would never see my son it was four days before his birthday. It's hard to get close to anyone that have any kind of relationship and hard to talk about it. Right after it happened, I laid on the floor for days in a fetal position and only ate to survive. I don't think I can never get over this. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Mr. Williams, would you like to make a statement on your behalf to the board? Yes, sir, I sure would. <laughs> I'd like to apologize to Mrs. Pierce. I'm, I am deeply sorry. I have committed something so horrible. And for you to feel that way, I, I have to understand it. I, um, I was doing drugs. I, I, I don't know what came over me. And um, Ma'am, I mean, if there is something else that maybe you can forgive speak, me. I'm so speak sorry. Speak to the board. Speak to the board. Don't speak to the board all. Okay. Um, I hope I'm just one. I've changed, Miss. Uh, I mean, I've changed. I, I don't want to. I have to say that I have changed, but. Being locked up all this time, I've grown to understand that there is a different way of handling certain situations when you're down or low. 
and I didn't know that then as a kid. I didn't know that growing up in the streets. I didn't I didn't understand all of those things. I just felt like that the streets was perfect for me. I didn't know a better way. I, I've worked, I've worked hard, I've worked all my life. But I found the streets to be more of a, a friend to me. And when I started doing those drugs, I just I, I didn't have a I didn't have a future, nothing else. I didn't I didn't see anything being bright. I've been locked up the last 23 and a half years now. I, I know, you know, there's a change that and I've I've committed to myself to changing. Yeah, I fell back a few times. And it was just stupidity things that I did. But I walk forward. I, I hopefully that I can have the chance that the board sees that, regardless of the few writers, all the write-ups and things that I've had. And I would love to have a fresh start and a new one. All right. Thank you for your comment. Now, prepare to vote. I'll vote first, Mr. Arthur. Listen, you know, you, you're saying you, you're doing right and doing right two things. You, you, you do. You've had write-ups every year. You've had them every year. Not just, you didn't fall back just last year. You've had 46 write-ups from 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. That's something you need to get under control. You do need to, for me to ever support you, you're going to have to complete the sex offender treatment. Uh, but you have victim opposition, law enforcement opposition. You need sex offender treatment. You have poor uh, institutional records. So my vote is to deny you parole. Ms. Wise. Uh, uh, Mr. Williams, uh, I've listened intently. And um, uh, to the young lady, you're a victim. I, I just applaud you, the courage and determination it took to let your voice be heard today. And I heard you. And, and I believe Mr. Williams did too. I believe he, I don't think he never heard of it before. But uh, as to you and my vote, my vote is to deny as well. Uh, <clears throat> but I, it seems like you found your sweet spot. Uh, I, I'm glad to hear what the warden is saying about you. At the end of the day, you are becoming a better human being. And I'm glad to hear that. So regardless of what happens today, you know, stay on that page. He has a lot of confidence in you. And your sister also wrote that you were a smart kid and you love books and you love math when you were growing up. So it sounds like you're kind of getting back to who, who you were, you know, born to be. But you've lost 386 days of good time, very poor supervision history. Uh, and some of the things that's already been stated, my voice has been nice. Best wishes to you. Ms. Bonnie Jackson. Hi, right, Mr. Williams. Um, I'm not going to rehash everything that you really tell me. And I think you just got a glimpse of what impact it's had on um, the victim in this case. And I hope that that has had an impact on you also. Um, I think it's important that you complete all phases of the sex offender program. Now, I understand that's not necessarily your fault that you have not been able to do that, but I think it's critical um, for you going forward uh, to complete all phases of that as well as victim awareness so that you really can you know, understand how devastating this has been for uh, the victim in this case. I do believe that you do like track. I do believe that you are salvageable, but I think you have some more work to do. So my vote today would be to deny, but to encourage you to uh, get in the sex program, complete all four phases, complete 15 years, and then uh, perhaps the next time you're up for consideration, your result will be different. Good luck to you. Thank you. Three votes have been denied today. Your parole's been denied. Good luck to you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to get into the unpacking of the crime by going through the records. But I first want to point out what I think. You know, this hearing, it, it, it was all but, what, 14 minutes? And what a difference it makes, I think, when you have the assistant district attorney show up to make a statement. to be there to back up the survivor who took the courage to show up. It's just so easy to forget. You know, there are some hearings where we watch, it could be the same type of crime, the same, but it's 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 like a whole, a whole ordeal. There are, you can have, you know, a full room with 
with with a packed house on speakers and support and speakers in opposition and the same exact hearing could last an hour yet for whatever reason it was just a quick 14 minute hearing and imagine if the survivor was there alone imagine if you didn't have miss wise at the end really compliment her um so we've seen it go that way and i think that that at least in this scenario we had we had randy meyer there in support and the the ada and we had miss wise uh take a moment to to to, to i guess suppose encourage her for doing that um now to the as miss jackson said the you know, it could be they didn't review all the details because they just knew they were going to oppose them anyways. It's hard to know why sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Um, thank you, Richard, for providing it. So the defendant, right, he was he was um, convicted by a jury for forcible sexual assault by Pamela. I'm um, sentenced to 40 years with two years without benefit of probation or parole. Um, can you imagine... It, that it, my understanding is that he would have been eligible for parole after just two years. Is that is that a is that possible? Um, in the late evening of December fourth, nineteen ninety eight, and early morning of December fifth, nineteen ninety eight, the victim patronized the pair of Dice Lounge, where she consumed several beers. At some point, she left the lounge for the night and started driving to, uh, home towards Kenner. The victim admitted that she was intoxicated when she left the lounge and had a vague memory of the events uh, leading up to the incident. She recalled the defendant was a passenger in her car, although she could not remember when or where she met the defendant, whether she offered him a ride or whether uh, he asked for a ride. She testified that she had never seen the defendant before that night. Um, the victim recalled that she stopped her car on a dead end street somewhere in Kenner. The defendant got out of the car, but said that he would be right back. When the defendant returned, the victim exited the vehicle and accompanied the defendant up a levee to Warren Bakeman. She then became nervous and started to turn around to leave when the defendant grabbed her arm and pushed her down the ground. The victim stated that the defendant was armed with a knife and threatened to to end her life if she yelled and then removed the victim's shoes and pants and proceeded to sexually assault her he then attempted to penetrate her um anally however she screamed as he stopped at one point she got up and tried to run but the defendant caught her pushed her down to the ground again punched her in the face and then assaulted her a second time she said that he also attempted to get her to perform oral on him. Next, the defendant ordered the victim to get dressed. They walked down the embankment to a nearby shed where another man was waiting. The defendant ordered the victim to get into bed with the other man who also assaulted her. However, after begging him to help her, the second man said he would and left the shed. The victim then got dressed. When she left the shed, she saw the defendant rummaging through her car and exchanging words with the second man. The defendant told the victim to get into the car. He got into the driver's seat and started driving. When they reached the traffic light at the intersection of William Boulevard and I-10, the victim jumped out of the car because she was afraid of where he might take her and what he might do to her when he got to the inter interstate highway. She ran off the road and hid behind some concrete pillars. Can you imagine how terrifying? Um, Officer Tommy Pell was called to the scene. He testified that the victim was crying and hysterical upon his arrival. He stated that she had lacerations on her forehead and bruises on her arm. The victim was eventually taken to the Lakeside Hospital where Dr. Vernon Curry performed uh, an assault examination. He testified that the victim was very upset and was crying when she arrived at the hospital. He observed a cut over her right eye, bruising of her left cheek, and a bruising and abrasions of her left arm and right elbow. Her pelvic exam by Dr. Curry revealed no trauma to the, to the vaginal area. Approximately two days later, Detective Mike Jackson prepared 
and presented a photographic lineup to the victim, and she identified the defendant as the first man who assaulted her. He was subsequently arrested. On appeal, the defendant contends that the evidence was insufficient to support conviction of forcible assault. The trial judge erred in denying his motion to suppress the, the identification of the sentence and that the sentence is excessive. The defendant claims that the evidence was insufficient to convict him of sexual assault. He argues, okay, so that was that was it. You know, what's interesting is that it doesn't seem that they, it doesn't seem that they tested her for like uh, narcotics. Like if, if they given her like a, a roofie or something, which sounds like what happened. I mean, she wakes up, like all of a sudden she realizes she's in a car with someone she doesn't even know who, who that is. Uh, although, would someone give someone a roofie and then have them drive? Versus them driving? I don't know. I don't really know. You know, that's, but, um, because it can't happen after just a couple of beers. He argues that only the evidence against him was uncooperated and inconsistent with the testimony. He, you know, it seems like they made a mistake, right? They should have tested her. He complains that there was no scientific evidence leaking him to the sexual assault, even though blood and hair samples were taken from him. There was no evidence of, of, of vaginal trauma to the victim, and there was no evidence of, of motile sperm. In the victim. Um, the standard for appellate review of sufficiency of evidence is whether, after viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the prosecution, any rational tier of fact could be found essential elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, They're just going down what, let's see what his else's argument is. Defense counsel cross-examined the victim at trial. So she took the stand, right? This is a trial, not a plea deal. And um, regarding various inconsistencies in her account of the assault, the jury was aware of the prior inconsistent statement and obviously found the victim's trial testimony credible. We will not second guess the credibility finding. Further, the facts represents, uh, presented by the victim were sufficient for a rational tier of fact included beyond a reasonable doubt and the defendant committed on the offense. Where did they say that there was inconsistencies? I don't see where that is. Oh, is it here? The defendant first argues that the only evidence linking him to the crime was the victim's inconsistent account of the assault. During the examination, the victim told medical personnel that there were two men in her car and that she was assaulted on the embankment by the two men. However, in her statement to the police and her trial testimony, she stated that there was only one man in her car and that he was assaulted. She was assaulted on the um, and that he assaulted her on the embankment while another man assaulted her in the shed. In addition, the defendant points out the victim's vague recollection that's leading to it. Okay, so that was the inconsistency. Again, it's hard to understand why they didn't test her for um, for substances that they may have given her, or he may have given her, to get her to that state. Uh, defense counsel cross-examined the victim trial regarding various inconsistencies uh, of the account. The jury was aware of the, Okay, I read that already. Um, now, second, the defendant argues that the victim's identification of him by the photographic lineup and in the court identification should have been suppressed. He contends that marks on the back of his photograph in the lineup, which allegedly left the imprint that could be seen on the front of the photo were unduly suggestive and rendered the photographic identification inadmissible. The defendant further asserts that the victim's in-court identification should have been suppressed because it was tainted by impermissibly suggestive photographic lineup shown to the victim prior to the trial. Um...
The detective, Detective Jackson, composed the photographic lineup and presented it to the victim two days after the incident. However, on the day before the victim was shown the photographic lineup, Detective Jackson showed the same photographic lineup to the co-defendant, Eugene Brown. Brown identified the picture. Oh, so they got the co-defendant first. Brown identified the picture and signed his name, date, and time on the back and instructed by, as instructed by the detective. When the victim was shown the lineup, Detective Jackson testified that the victim did not hesitate in identifying the defendant's picture. She also signed and dated the back of the photo, which she identified. However, the defendant contends that Brown's signature and other writings on the back of the photographic left an imprint that could be seen on the front of the picture. He claims the victim could see imprint which drew undue attention to his photograph. So basically what, right, is that when he signed the back and then you flipped it over, you could see the markings. Which I hear that 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 kind of makes sense. So if you have four photos and you just see one with markings, and she knew that it would be signed, she knew to look for those markings, and she would know. The victim was not called to testify at the hearing of the motions to suppress, but Detective Jackson testified. The victim identified the defendant's photograph without hesitation and did not say that she saw anything on the photographs. Detective Jackson admitted that if he looked closely and the lighting was just right, he could see some indentation on the photograph. Furthermore, the trial judge examined the photographic, the photographic lineup and did not see any markings on the photograph that would draw attention. Okay, so it really wasn't. The judge did not feel that it was. In reviewing the photographic lineup, we note that all photographs in the lineup are of black men of approximately the same age, have shaved haircuts, some sort of mustache, and have similarly shaped noses and lips. It's very difficult to see any um, back imprints. It is interesting that they found zero DNA. Uh, I'm not saying he's innocent, but I wonder. I wonder in today's day and age, where everyone expects DNA, if this, if the jury would have found some type of different uh, outcome. A sentence for forcible sexual assault must be served hard labor, minimum of five years, maximum of forty years. At least two years must be imposed, benefit of probation or parole. Um, And finding maximum sentence not to be excessive. In the present case, the defendant vaginally assaulted the victim twice and attempted the other form of, of assault. When she tried to escape, he punched her in the face, armed with a knife, he threatened to, to end her life. He then caused her to be assaulted by a second man. We find that under the facts of this case, which are contained in the record, the maximum sentence of 40 years was not constitutionally excessive. Um, you know, you almost wonder if, if, uh, Kelsey or Nish Jackson should have gone into the details and maybe it's too traumatic for this, for the victim, the survivor, but also to know for him to own up to what he did just to hear, you know, I, I guess because they never expected to parole him with his record, they just didn't want to have to rehash it with the with the survivor on the line maybe that's it um but man this is it's uh you heard it in her voice i mean that's the thing you you hear it 20 years later and just the trauma and the pain and and how her whole life was changed from this incident it's quite terrifying Um, but she stood up at the trial and she stood up at the parole hearing and whole come back. This hearing took place in 2022. So we will see him at some time, uh, the next few years. And when we do, we'll play it for you. But with that, I'll let you go.